My name is John Passfield, and the title of this reading will be John and Cassandra, Video 7, Meeting Apollo, Part 1. Here is my novella, John and Cassandra, Fair is Fair. That's uh, Apollo, the big fellow in the middle, the god, and the two little humans, John and Cassandra, are down below. Here's a summary as printed on the back cover. Author John Passfield contemplates writing a novel about the mythological figure Cassandra. Suddenly, he finds himself in the presence of her tormentor, Apollo, the god who, seemingly as a whim, has brought a catastrophic curse down on the head of an innocent human. John sees Cassandra as a mythical creature whose helpless situation epitomizes all that is wrong on the planet Earth. What a chance to confront a representative of the gods, ask him to explain such actions, and demand an immediate end to all the agony in the world. Now, in this novella, there are four chapters in which John meets Apollo, the god who has placed a curse on the human girl Cassandra. In each of these chapters, there are four segments wherein John and Apollo interact. I'll read the four segments that are found in chapter 2. So this is the very first meeting. Chapter 2, page 7. Between John and Apollo. Here we are. It'll be interesting to see how many words John gets to speak uh, in this conversation with Apollo. Why do you keep coming back, John? Yes, the name is John. I know it is. I have a memory which never lets me down. I am the one the gods all ask when there is doubt. Well, I keep telling you I'm busy. Right now I'm deeply involved in the war, the war at Troy. I don't have time for your petty concerns about what it is to be human and alive. You have your lot in life, and that is that. Your life will be your life until you die. If you want to influence the gods, don't come whining here to me. Go back to your country and make a sacrifice. Pick the god whose sphere is the one of your concerns. So, that's Apollo speaking to John. I don't hear John saying anything there. Let's go on to the second segment where Apollo and John interact. I do not want to talk about this topic, John. My relationship with mortal girls. I do not see myself as a bragger, John, but if I just state the facts, inevitably it would appear like bragging to you. So that is why I put you off when you appeared before. This is such a minor topic. It is a very little concern. Let me simply say that I am busy, extremely busy, extremely concerned with the Trojan War, and I do not want to talk about this human girl. What, what was her name? Cassandra, did you say? The Trojan War is my main preoccupation for the foreseeable time. More time than you would care to spare in your mortal world. This girl, this girl Cassandra, is, is not a preoccupation for me at all. In fact, I'm surprised that you, a, a male, should demonstrate such misguided, distorted concerns. Okay, so that's Apollo again. John not getting a word in. Let's look at the third segment of the meeting between John and Apollo. You know, you don't seem to realize the implications of this, John, but the first time you came to see me and raised the question of that girl, I decided to end your visits once and for all. I put my sword right through your back as you turned around. And here you are, still standing, as much a pest as you were before. You have flesh, as I can see, but you don't seem to have a heart inside that lumpy bag of blood and cartilage and bone. You went on talking as if my sword was a figment of my mind. No human could have survived it. 
I have concluded that you are a god, a god in disguise. To what end? I cannot now conceive. I do not always get along with the other gods. Okay, John doesn't get a word in there. Let's have a look at the fourth interaction between John and the god Apollo. Listen, I don't understand very much of what you tell me, John. I don't know channels or communication satellites or watching the news. All I know is that you are telling me what it is to be human, to live on this earth and experience the catastrophes and the joys. Well, why should you be an exception, you and those people with whom you live in this Canadius or Canadia or or whatever you call the country in which you dwell? You think your land has been blessed by all of the gods? The gods squabble, the gods disagree. One will send, send sunshine and one will send rain. Find a cave in which to hide when it thunders. Come back outside when the sunshine reappears. You humans, complain when you break a fingernail. That's the way it is, John. Ours to grant pleasure, ours to inflict pain. Yours to suffer or enjoy. Yours to give thanks or to complain. Well, that's the fourth uh, segment of John and Apollo, and uh, John didn't get a word in edgewise. A number of years ago, I wrote a novel which I would like to mention as I read the note that I'm about to read. So I'll hold that novel up now, so I won't have to fish around for it as I read from my note. So the novel is this, Job, it's a little glary perhaps, Job, The Cornerstone of the Universe, a novel by John Passfield. Let me read the summary on the back cover. Racked by fever, tormented by boils, devastated by the loss of his entire family, the wretched Job cries out to the heavens. Why has his God forsaken him? Why do such things happen here on earth? Why is the universe so flawed? Why are human beings subjected to such agonizing torments? He shakes his fist at the sky and demands a personal audience. His agony has given him the questions. He insists on hearing the answers from the mouth of God. So that's the novel which I wrote, and it's available on Amazon. But now back to speaking about uh, John and Cassandra. The situation of the story of Cassandra is as old as human storytelling. One of the oldest human stories is that of Job, as told in Hebrew scripture and in the Christian Bible. In fact, a few years ago, I wrote a novel about that very story, the one I just held up. The title of the novel is Job, the Cornerstone of the Universe. In the Job story and in my Cassandra story, a human being decides that the human situation on earth is not the best possible situation that humans can imagine. In the story which we find in the ancient text, Job meets God face to face and asks why human beings are forced to suffer and why their lives cannot be made more pleasant. In the original Cassandra story, which has been told by many writers, Homer among them, what we have is that Cassandra is a human being on whom has been placed a double curse. The first curse, which the Apollo of this story claims he meant as a blessing, bestowed on the girl when he thought they were on better terms, is that she can see into the future. Well, that sounds very positive. However, the second curse, which Apollo says he placed on Cassandra when he realized they were not on good terms, is that no one will believe her when she tells them about the future. So, why does serious literature, stretching back to what might have been one of the first five or ten stories told around the campfire by the earliest human beings, or even by the earliest Neanderthals, have situations that recur in essential form over the centuries. Well, I believe it's because only one of the aims of serious literature is to tell a story. The other aim 
of serious liturgists to create imagery which illustrates what life has been like, is like, and always will be like for the human being as we interact with our fellow creatures and with the nature of life here on the planet Earth. None of these stories in asking why humans suffer is able to give an answer as I don't believe human beings know why the an- know the answer as to why life can be so difficult here on Earth. All of these stories do is express the dismay, the frustration, and even the anger that human beings feel when life is, no- is a lot more difficult for us than we feel it should be or could be. If whatever powers that put us in this situation were to change their minds about hu- what human life should be like. Of course, in some variations, and what I would call the surface story, the plight of the individual in that particular telling of the story is made a little less onerous. In the story that is found in Hebrew scripture and in the Christian Bible, Job gets a second family and a second flock of animals, which makes some people feel that the story has a happy ending. When I read that story, when I read that story, sorry, I always feel that as nice as it is for the individual who's depicted in that version of a story to get a happy ending, the main point of the story that all the variations on the Job story make is that life always has been difficult here on earth. It's difficult now and always will be difficult no matter the ending of any individual version of that story. In this story, the story of Cassandra, I didn't add a dash of happy ending for Cassandra. I simply went along with what all of the versions of the Cassandra story present to us, that the higher powers have no interest in making life easier for human beings. And that's the end of the note. So here again is my novella, John and Cassandra, Fair is Fair. It's found on Amazon where you'll find more information my publisher's website is rocksmillspress.com. There's more information there. My website is johnpassfield.ca. It's all one word. And there are two free books there, two books you can access for free. My planning notebook in which I plan and write the novella and my journal, my reflective journal, in which I reflect on topics that the uh, story raises. So have a look there at johnpassfield.ca if you're interested. Lastly, I'll just say thank you for watching this video.